Alright, continuing this rather, I think, unproductive conversation with Piro about logic. Um, yeah, well, we'll keep talking for a little while, but it does seem a little bit pointless. Like, we're really not going anywhere. So, I don't know. Play some of this. You, right now, are showing an ability to comprehend logical, philosophical statements. Going back to realism at Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, you said that the fact that I believe and will say that material exists means that I'm a realist, because I think it exists separate from me perceiving it. That, like, for example, if I die, that it will go on existing. And yeah, um, and that if, if your interaction is not necessary to its function... I mean, you don't even have to die to acknowledge that the thing is doing its thing. It's not doing it for you. The material universe does not exist um, and does not form itself or behave itself um, as if it were acting for you. Uh, something like that. You said you read this definition and you accept this definition, and you obviously misread it. It's, it's only a goddamn. And yeah, I, I'm fine with the definition too, and I don't see how you can undo the definition unless you play silly word games, and I think that's what you're going to do. A single sentence. And me believing that material, the material world exists, the phenomena exist, does not subject me to this definition. Well, yeah, the point you're making is that you're going beyond the definition. You're accepting the definition, but you're saying there's um, other qualities of things um, that are somehow affected by how you're affected. That somehow you receiving its waste, essentially, what's thrown off of it, the odor of its smell, that somehow your perception of its odor somehow is affecting it. And that's where you go loopy and silly. So generic realist believes A, according to Stanford, A, B, and C, and so on exist. And the fact that they exist and have properties such as Fness, genus, and Hness is independent of anyone's belief, linguistic practices, conceptual schemes, and so on. All right. I mean, he said he read that kind of fast. I should have played it slower. Well, I can't really play it slower, but I can play it again. Um, and I think he's going to hang on linguistic practices, and that's because he's going to pervert what that means, I think, in the context. I think all they're saying in the context is it doesn't matter whether you call it red, blue, green. It doesn't matter what the word is for it. I mean, red could be fug or mogudi or anything. The point is, is that it's a recognized function of the thing that produces the red color. And that it's, it's the color it's producing, the energy it's producing, at the wavelength it's producing it, is always consistent. It doesn't matter how people interpret it, how they manipulate it, what it's producing is always the same. This believes A, according to Stanford, A, B, and C, and so on exist. And the fact that they exist and have properties such as Fness, Genus, and Hness is independent of anyone's belief, linguistic practices, conceptual schemes, and so on. Yeah, so that basically means that the moon is going to orbit the Earth and it's not going to care whether we contemplate it or whether we do anything about it. It doesn't care what we call it. it doesn't, none of that stuff is going to change one single little nuance of its orbit or anything else until we fly up there and actually land on it then the effect is still minimal, but at least now we are directly interacting with it in some way that can affect it, its properties, its reality. Yeah, now it has some extra gold on it. Um, some gold leaf, anyway, gold foil. Uh, but anyway, let's continue. Well, I don't believe things in themselves exist, because material exists. You're the one that assumes that means it's the thing that has that. Um, yeah, look, the word thing is being used to describe the fact that we can recognize distinctions, again, between material. All right, some materials, this class, that class, that class, that class. So we distinguish paper from mud, from dirt, from plastic, from water, they're all distinctly identifiable things, and that's what a thing is. We're not saying 
the thing is all the thing is, that the thing isn't made out of other things, and that those things aren't made of things, and those things aren't made of things. We're just saying that we can recognize things even on this level, and larger even. We can recognize civilizations. We can recognize things that we would all agree that we can see the pieces. We recognize a car as a thing, but we all recognize the engine as a distinctly different thing from the tail, from the trunk. So, from the gas tank, we can recognize things. So you can't argue there's no things, it's just a silly idea. Thing is a, is a fundamental concept of rational thought. It's a genus, and I'm saying it's not a thing, and why? Anything could be called a thing. Yeah, in normal language, but not in philosophical language. Not... <clears throat> yeah, well, anything, okay, that you can thingerize that actually has a distinction, that actually has something about it. A quality can be a thing. A function can be a thing. A thing can be a thing. Anything that distinguishes itself, creates a border between itself and other things, creates some capacity to recognize it as distinctly separate from that thing, okay, is a thing. And if you can't accept that, I mean, that's just that that just it's that there's that that almost is a non-starter. You almost can't do anything rational um, with a world where I'm going to accept that these two things are not things. What the fuck you doing, cat? Huh? What are you doing? Don't do something stupid. Don't make me come after you. Your logic. To be a thing, it has to have properties. Fness, genus, hness. What are you doing? Predicates that apply proper properties to the object, to an identified object. And the identification has to be sufficient, <laughs> of necessary and sufficient conditions. And that's what I don't believe. Yeah, material exists. It doesn't have hness. Well, I don't know what, how, how you undo the hness. I don't know. Um, the, the, the word materiality is just a shorthand. Again, for a qualification of things that have, you know, matter that has formed itself, um, energy that has formed itself into this cellular stuff, I mean this uh, uh, molecular stuff. You know, it's, it's formed into atoms that now have created um, their own elementary um, classifications, their, their, their own elementary properties. The elements give the thing properties, the chemistry gives it properties. Um, it's just not debatable or disputable. I've got to go deal with this cat. I'm back, I think. Uh, look, you know, when you said H-ness, you know, Puro, um, H-ness is just a, 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 a placeholder. I mean, it's just a word. So you're just basically saying that some property doesn't exist. So define a property that doesn't exist, one that you reject. Because any one of those things could be any property. It could be the plasticness of this bottle, or it could be... Uh, the potato-ness here, this, this potato, yes, my garden was a bit of a failure, this is my potato. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit small, um, but it's perfect, otherwise it's a perfect potato. Um, except it's small. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, the fact that it has a skin, that would be an H. Now how are you going to undo the skin on this potato? You're not going to undo it. There's no, there's no undoing its H-ness. How would it? It's just a word made up. They're not just words made up. They're efforts to, again, define things. As it words do, they define, they describe. And uh, that's why words have definitions. Specifically because they're defining things. Damn it. Um, so it's not just made up. Uh, the fact is we have words that are sloppy um, and messy and inaccurate. The definitions are inaccurate. Um, they're, they're likely to cause a problem because there's a, uh, a falsehood built into them. So yeah, we should fix those. We should fix sloppy language. Um, words like objective should mean the same thing to me and the same thing to you. And they don't. And that is problematic. When you believe that the things of nature are really, um, more wave-like and flow-oriented. Yeah, that's, that's right. That was my accusation in the last video and that's what you're doing here wave-like and flow. You're just, you're just attempting again to make something that is explicit, something that is precise. It's doing a very precise thing, a very deterministic, 
um, disciplined, rule obeying. Um, it's as it's, it's functional as a hammer hitting a nail. And you want to turn hammer hitting a nail into something fudgy. Okay, you want to turn it into something dissolving and, and appearing and disappearing and you know you want to make it so there is this cognitive dissonance that'll make room for your fairy tales and that's all this is about in the end in my opinion flow concepts about flow flow fluctuation flux yeah yeah like i said there is no such thing that's an illusion of our senses all right, just like any vibration, any stimulation that comes into our senses too fast, we can't, I can't see the frame rate of this video. All right, it eludes my senses, but I intellectually understand it's a series of still images. It's not a flow or a flux or any of that crap. It's a series of the precise digital images. Or, uh, or more apt. You know, things don't have inherent properties then, because they're systems. Well, that, and that's just playing a game with words again, as if they're implying again that system means that it's beyond description, that the system doesn't have an explicit function, um, that it isn't um, confined by the laws and the rules governing the circumstance the physical laws and the circumstance of their position at the moment you're judging it or looking at it or, or evaluating it. Um, that systems don't have, um, you know, garbage in, garbage out. That if you put reliable information in, it will produce reliable output. That's a fact. Systems are incredibly uh, not flowy. It becomes compatible with what we've noticed in nature now, that Red is not in the red apple, like... See, see, this is where you go all wrong, just catastrophically wrong. Um, the fact is, the red is part of the apple's function. The, the apple changes the wavelength of the light that strikes it, all right? It changes, it, it reflects it, all right, in a consistent pattern of uh, red wavelength, all right? It's a fact. It's... The wavelength has been changed by the light reflecting off the apple. It has manipulated and distorted and altered the light that came in and it's producing something. It's giving something else back. It's functioning. It's part of its function. All right? It's producing that red. It's not an illusion. It's a reality. It changes the wavelength of the light. Plato thought. Red is a behavior of the system. So-called properties of, of these systems. If they... <laughs> the system, now you're going to imply that has something to do with the receiver. Again, no. It doesn't matter who the receiver is, what the receiver is doing, the apple will produce exactly the same effect. But it is producing an effect that we call red. And it's consistent that every apple that produces that red effect will be of uh, the same molecular configuration that produced that red effect. These systems are not inherent properties, but I can see it that way. Yeah, and, and miss the boat on the important subtle issue. No, you're the one off the rails, okay? You're off the rails. The apple produced the red. Just because you haven't gone out to enough decimal places. What they... What they what is called a property is really just an expression of that system. It's a behavior of that system. Same difference. Properties are measured by behavior. So again, that's not where the argument is. You're going to argue that somehow the individual receiving the red is somehow, somehow defining the apple. And the apple doesn't need you to see the red for it to be producing red. You know, and we have to make exceptions for classical logic all the time. We don't say the mirror is red just because it's reflecting a, a red wall. You have the mirror tilted at a red wall. <clears throat> and see, this is where you made your mistake. Because we don't say that because the mirror doesn't change anything. The mirror reflects what goes in, comes out. So it's a distinctly different thing. The mirror does not produce red. Red comes in, it gives back what it got. So it's doing something different than what the apple's doing. 
That's what's called it, comparing apples and oranges. Mirrors are oranges, apples are apples. They're different and they're functioning different. And they're doing a different thing because they have different characteristics and properties. Mirror's red, you don't say that just because it's reflecting light. But if the apple is red, yeah, because you don't see the red source, you have a color. Yeah, because the red source doesn't have a red source. Because the source is the function of the apple. The apple altered the light. But it's the same thing. Those are systems interacting with other systems. And the property is not inherent. And that's why it's <clears throat> Yeah, no. Well, see, the property is inherent. The change of the wavelength of light as it hits these opaque objects is a function of the opaque object. That's what opaque objects do. They usually, like almost always, <laughs> except for mirrors, um, alter. Uh, the wavelength of the light. They reflect. And their, the reflection is complicated because it may, in fact, not be truly a reflection. It's an absorption and rejection of energy. They're producing, they're consuming the energy and, and, and losing it back, taking some portion of it and throwing back a portion of it. And that's the change that's created where the mirror is absorbing little or nothing. Important, because classically it's supposed to be inherent, and yet properties come and go, and oh, they adhere so well, why are they, the bonding so weak? It's because your model, to make that model work, it has, everything has to be bouncing around. When it's a system, you... Well, see, again, there might not even be any bouncing around technically, so I'm not going to know these draft science videos, but again, this is an illusion. There may never not be such a thing as a bounce in, the, in our classical understanding of bounce. All right? There's an energy transfer that um, yeah, maybe requires more explicit language to be, um, to be honest to what's truly happening. We gain continuity by acknowledging time becoming the other irregular verb besides to be that we based all of this logic on of to do and related to become. Well, there, that's just, again, that's, you want to call that philosophy, to do and to become? This, this, this is, this is mumbo-jumbo. This is, you know, yeah, that's, what do you take that from the Professor Anton pamphlet of babbly bullshit? Now, even if material, just by me saying it exists, did have to be a thing, it did have to have properties, which you probably say, because you can look at it that way, and therefore, that must be the best model possible. Well, I think the point is, is it's a, it's, a, it's a rational model that's consistent with the evidence and is inconsistent with this silly talk about how somehow it's really dependent on me perceiving it. And it's not. It has, it's, it's doing exactly what it's doing, whether I'm looking at it or not. I mean, if, you know, if you could imagine a brain inside the moon, it could observe everything that we observe on the Earth, plus us. And it could just turn us into things like everything else, and it could under, it could even, if we gave it the power to even see through our eyes, to live through our consciousness, and experience our experiences, and to, to, to taste life in that sense. It could sample a thousand human lives, and it could it could draw conclusions about what this is doing and why it's reacting this way and why it does what it does. Um, it would be completely observable and you dissectable. And that's what freaking logic allows us to do, is to understand the mechanisms, understand what they're producing, how they're affecting. That's, that's rational, that's logical. But you're talking about effects as if they are you know, when they're human, somehow, all of a sudden, they're somehow different than all the other rule-abating phenomena. Like, I built a model of the Sistine Chapel. It must be the Sistine Chapel. You build a more accurate model of the Sistine Chapel. It must be... I... None of them are the Sistine Chapel because of this time continuity. There is no... Oh, whatever, again, so, so this is... You know, this is taking things to these decimal places we don't need to take them to. We, we know function. Um, 
you just don't have to take your you just don't have to take the molecules of your car apart to know that if you go sit in it and turn the key the engine will turn on and you can get to the store that's the level that um, most of our logical statements are going to be dealing with is the broadest functionality and not the irrelevant there's gravel rocks in my driveway I can be aware of them I can be conscious of them I can look at them but as a practical matter as a practical reality even though there's a million of them they have nothing to do with my life they'll have no effect on it in any substantial or significant way Anxious to worry about it's just, it doesn't have Sistine Chapelness in it to worry about but even if, if believing in material meant that material is a thing and it was ethnic and the traditional logic works on reasoning with it, it would still have to believe that I believed in that independent of anyone's beliefs, linguistic practices, or conceptual schemas. And I don't. Gary went on. <clears throat> yeah, well, that, so right there. So that's the concession. So, you know, what's the point? I mean, if you think um, the apple gives a fuck whether you call it red or whether you call it Funkle, then you're stupid. If you think the red changes because you recognize it, your eye is sensitive to, to the detecting the distinction, the change the apple has created in the light reflect, ref, reflecting, then you're then you're beyond hope. I don't worry about how much truth is relative to the language and the language, how much you narrow it down. And it's dependent on linguistic practices. But I think the thing... It's not dependent. That's the thing where you're getting it wrong. The thing is not dependent on our linguist practices. What it's doing, how it's functioning, all of that, its relationships, its origins, the whole thing, all that story is completely the same story whether we tell the story right or wrong. It doesn't matter um, what we perceive. Okay, the point is, is that we are attempting to perceive the truth of its circumstance, its function, its origin, its interactions. Damn it. It's like a data structure in the mind. You know, it is to a book, the digital representation of the book in a computer, you know, in an e-reader. So the thing that has properties is, is in our head. We get a bunch of... The thing that has properties is in our head. Again, this is like saying the rock isn't a rock. Um, it's only my perception that it's a rock. That doesn't make any sense. It's a rock. All right? It, it has its characteristics, its function, its life history, its origins, its destiny. I mean, all these things are going to be the same whether I perceive it or not. I'm attempting to model its existence. I'm not making up its existence. And the way we test our model is through logic. We use logic to see if our standards for judging the rock are the same for our standards for judging things with other characteristics and whether there's a consistency in our descriptions and how we drew these lines of distinction between these things. And all we're looking for are contradictions, hypocrisies, duplicities, cheats, um, and, you know, things that would um, show an inconsistency between how they're measured or how they're judged or how they're being evaluated or how they were tested. That's what we're looking for. But if we don't find any of those, then we got it right. Qualia, we bundle them together. And qualia. So, I mean, you know, another word that just doesn't belong in a rational philosophical conversation, in my opinion. Um, as some sort of, you know, if this word had a consistent definition. Um, and let's say it did, and that consistent jet definition was it's just some loose terminology used to describe sensation. Well, okay. But that's, you know. It's still, it's still just a concession to um, a lack of detail that we are providing. We obviously have sensation because of a psychology and physiology and neural system. And those are explicit things that take place within us. And some of them are consistent from human to human, and some of them are not consistent from human to human. But we can make general statements about them. Ah. See, look, now the thing has quality. Quality uh, pure quality. This is red. This is heat. We bundle them together and say, okay, there's something relating all these qualia. And that thing is on our head. So it's definitely dependent on your personal... No. 
uh, you know, I'm sorry. I mean, the 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 uh, the the consistency of form or function puts things into a category that we can notice. Like I said, we're noticing the similarity. Like all the suns that are burning, each one is individual and different, but we recognize the consistent character of them and call them one kind of thing. Now that distinction, the fact that we're calling them one kind of thing is not critical to their function, all right? But it is a characteristic of their fact. It's a fact of their circumstance that is gleanable. We can glean that fact. We can find that fact. We don't make it up. We discover it. We see it. Just as we can discover the circumstantial relationship between diameters and circumferences or angles and the length of sides of triangles. Belief. Though you can argue because of the word belief that no, it's not like whatever you believe is true. But it is not independent either. Your beliefs have an effect on it. But even more... Your beliefs have an effect on it. So right there you're going to get into real trouble. Your beliefs have an effect on what? What? What are you talking about? What do beliefs affect, except for other people who hear your belief? Or your beliefs affect how you act? But what's this it is talking about? What are, what are beliefs affecting? So the linguistic practices and the conceptual schemas, when we get into a more scientific term for this, the way your brain is made up, both biologically built in and the things you learn and what is your day of the day and your blood sugar level. All that crap just means whether you're going to get the answer right or whether you're going to get the answer wrong. It's not going to change the right answer. The right answer is out there. There are factual statements. There are inaccurate statements. There are incomplete statements. There are all kinds of errors that we can make. And our subjectivity, our, our qualiness can make us fuck it up. But it doesn't change the fact and if we're missing something, if we don't see the magician pull the fucking bird out of its, you know, it's got it up its sleeve, and we don't really see how he did it, um, the fact is he did it, all right? We don't have to see it all for it all to exist, and we're still trying to just discover it, all right? But it just, our fucking emotional bullshit has nothing to do with the fact that that's where the damn bird came from. It was shoved down his fucking sleeve. And all of these things expressing themselves through a conceptual schema, a way of thinking about stuff, that defines what objects and what properties you're going to see and reason with. Well, like I said, the, what's, what becomes relevant and meaningful, it will define what facts we care to know. But it doesn't change the fact that facts are there to know. So yeah, there's a whole bunch of facts that I can find out about all the rocks in my driveway. I could find out what percentage are what color and what, what the average size is. I could find out lots of information about their reality, about the reality of the driveway. But I don't need to know it, so I don't have to go get that information. But that information is there to go get, and it's part of the reality. How many inches separate them or how much weight mass is distributed, and all those things are facts. They're facts of their circumstance, of their function, of their quality, of their characteristics, of their all this stuff. The A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K is all out there, and all we're doing is trying to find it. And the fact that we care more about stuff that means something to us as sentient beings um, that's going to have some effect on whether we're going to get fed or laid, well, duh. And the fact that I believe there's a real material world, and it's just that it, things turns out to be no better than God at modeling it, doesn't mean I'm a realist. Realists are people that believe that this traditional epistemological framework is actually somehow out there in the real world. That, yeah, that there is a relationship. That things are two inches apart, and that things do weigh a certain amount, and that things do function a certain way, and that the apple does reflect red. Um, whether you call it red or not, whether it's a wavelength of light, they do reflect that wavelength of light. Um, yeah, these are facts. You don't need a human to categorize something for it to get in one of these categories. It's out there sitting in its category, and it's category. Yeah, well, it doesn't have 
you know, written on the apple is not, and it's not going to be the words. I commonly produce the uh, wavelength of what is perceived as red by human sapiens on Earth. Yeah, it doesn't have that written on it. But the fact is, is the truth of it is true. The truth is, is this is how rapples affect human perception by creating the illusion of a red color. That's a fact. It's sitting in the real world. And I don't believe that. Therefore, I'm not a realist. And if you can't read this definition and see that, then I think we have a, a starting point that goes... No, I think we have a finishing point that goes to the point that there's no point in talking with people who think um, reality is waiting for us to discover it. It's not waiting for us. Um, people who think reality changes because we perceive it differently. No. We either get it right or we get it wrong. We either make a statement about it that's correct or we make a statement about it that's incorrect. But that's all there is. All right? And we're going to more likely be correct, in my opinion, um, if we strict stick to some logical discipline. If you, if you were more like the Vulcan you look like... Um, yeah, then you'd get it right. But if you're going to play this fudgy little, you know, flowy little wavy bullshit, um, you're going to fail to get it right. Back to uh, critical reading and philosophical reading. And also, I don't know about your philosophical education. You know, I rejected a lot of the things oh, I was... Well, who cares about all that crap? Um, yeah, I mean, really, fuck this shit. Um, where we have to go back and fit into some category of, you know, uh, you're a Borite or an Einsteinist. And fuck you. Uh, anyway, enough of the video. Yeah, it's just very discouraging. Um, my guess. I mean, what I would like is a challenge to my theory, okay, that the truth isn't out there to be discovered. That the relation, that statements can be made that are either factually correct or factually incorrect. Yeah.